When Nigel Hamilton was a student at Cambridge University in Great Britain, he stayed for a brief time with Winston and Lady Churchill at their home at Chartwell in Kent. He also spent hours talking about World War II after the war, of course, with Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. These experiences led to a life as an author about history. He first moved to the United States in 1988. He's based in the Boston, Massachusetts area. Books in his career include the bestseller JFK, Reckless Youth, two volumes on President Bill Clinton, and a trilogy on FDR about his role as Commander-in-Chief of World War II from 1941 to 1945. Nigel Hamilton is now an American citizen. Hi, this is Rachel from C-SPAN's podcast team. And before we get to this week's episode, I'd like to introduce you to one of the producers here at C-SPAN, my colleague, Sean. Thanks, Rachel. If you're a fan of Book Notes Plus, we think you'll also like our evening newsletter, Word for Word, which brings you a recap of the day's most important political and policy events delivered right to your inbox. Read about what happened on Capitol Hill and at the White House and watch video highlights featuring the day's newsmakers. Hear them word for word. Join our community of informed listeners and viewers. Head over to cspan.org slash connect and subscribe to Word for Word today. Thanks for listening and staying connected with Word for Word. Subscribe now at cspan.org slash connect. Thank you. Nigel Hamilton, what's the first thing you tell a student or somebody who's just interested about biography and how to write it? I think the very first thing is you start with curiosity. If, if you're not curious about a specific human being and their place in their society or in history, um, there's no point in uh, trying to um, look at or narrate their life. You, you, so biography starts basically with curiosity. What's next? Well, then you've got to have, I think, uh, a certain amount of energy to do the work that's involved in biography. And I think that's something that's often forgotten uh, because, you know, the, the honest truth is I, I never wanted to be a biographer. I, I wanted to be a, a novelist and a short story writer and a poet. <laughs> I didn't want to do biography. There's too much work. And, uh, you know, interestingly, you know, uh, Virginia Woolf, the, who, a really great novelist, did try her hand at biography. Uh, she, she, she did a biography of a, an English uh, art critic and uh, it was a disaster. And she herself, if you look at her diary, she keeps going on and on saying, this is like slavery, this is terrible, this is so much work involved in actually being truthful about real lives. So the second thing after curiosity is a willingness to do the research and to be able to look at uh, alternative uh, versions of the past and make your own gradually come to your own judgment. But you should not begin, I think, with a an idée fixe or a, a, a determination to um, extol the virtues of your of this character. Uh, you, and and the promise behind all that is that you will through the lens, through the window of this character, you will be able to look not only at a human life in the context of that human life, the, the domestic and, and wider kind, but you'll be able to look at a whole period of history. And uh, so uh, it, it has uh, tremendous uh, opportunities uh, if you're willing to do the work. I know you're working on a book now, and I don't want to take you too far with this because the book is not out, but what is the book and how far along are you in the process? Um, it's, it's a book uh, which follows my uh, FDR at War trilogy. It's, it's going to be called uh, Lincoln versus Davis, the 
the War of the Presidents. Uh, and it's the first study of how Lincoln as commander in chief in the Civil War uh, managed to, as a, as a politician without really any uh, military knowledge, how he managed to run a four year long major civil war against an opposing president uh, who was a trained and very experienced, uh, battle experienced uh, soldier in Jefferson Davis. And um, it is for me a first because I, I am by no means an expert on the civil war, uh, but it has been a journey of um, of self-education, if you like, and um, absolutely fascinating. So that will come out this year, 2000, 2000, this coming year, 2024 in November. So the audience and, will know we're, we're talking about this at the very end of 2023. And, and what time did you say in 20, 2024? Come in out? November. Oh, I mean, ironically, it will come probably after a, a similar contest between two American presidents. Uh, it, uh, it, it will only cover the first two years of the Civil War. It, it's really the story of, uh, of the Emancipation Proclamation, the true story behind the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and um, it, it's, it's been a tremendous um, challenge to write it because I began thinking that it was going to be a study of Lincoln as commander in chief using the lens which over 10 years I developed for looking at Franklin Roosevelt as commander in chief in a in a, in a world war. And I thought I could use that same lens uh, for uh, Abraham Lincoln. But I, I realized, and in fact, I got a commission from my publisher to do that. And but <laughs> it wasn't very long before I realized I was writing the wrong book. <laughs> I, I, my wife and I have my wife uh, comes from uh, Creole background in New Orleans and we have a house in New Orleans and we go down every winter and drive through <laughs> southern territory and with still a lot of confederate flags and um, and I was giving a few talks uh, on FDR in in, uh, in Louisiana and, and New Orleans and when I told people I was writing about the president about um, President Lincoln. They said, well, what about President Jefferson Davis? <laughs> and I realized that although Jefferson Davis is a, is a name that's almost totally forgotten up here in Boston, in Massachusetts, you know, he's still very much a, um, a figure, a representative figure of history um, and still quite close to people in the South. And so I, I, I'm not sure I became woke, but I, <laughs> I did w wake up to the realization that I was writing the wrong book, that this was a book that should look at the contest between these two figures, a politician and a born soldier, and, and how, how, how it evolved, how it turned out. And, um, how surprising the story really is, because in that sense, I, I believe it is a story that has not been t told, certainly in this way ever before. By the way, what's the di I know you're an American citizen now. What's the difference between being a British citizen and being an American citizen? They say we're divided by the same language. <laughs> but there are different habits, aren't there? And different likes and dislikes and just tell I me, mean, why would you become an American citizen? What drove you to that? Um, I had uh, I had interned on the Washington Post. My father, who came from a working class background, but became editor of the London 
Sunday Times and then editor in chief of the London Times wanted me to um, become a journalist. So he arranged for me to do an internship on the Washington Post. And um, I, I, I went there as a student, a Cambridge University student from England, and I thought I came from the center of the <laughs> of the intellectual universe in the fens of Cambridgeshire, England. And I very quickly realized that, uh, you know, Washington was in fact the, <laughs> the center of the, not just political, but in many ways, the intellectual world in terms of thinking about society and history and the future. And um, so I, I very much went back to England with my tail between my legs and, and uh, and then years later, I had written a, a series of books about uh, World War II and um, particularly about uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, who commanded the American and British and Canadian armies at D-Day. I'd written a trilogy about him. And um, I, th I, my father had just died and I, I felt it was time to do something different. I was living in London and, and I thought, well, I, during that internship in, in Washington, I had uh, met uh, Senator Robert Kennedy and um, covered him a little bit with, for the newspaper. And um, so I, I, I came over to the United States to write a, a new biography uh, of uh, President Kennedy, uh, JFK, and um, I became a visiting professor at the University of Massachusetts because the uh, presidential library is next door. Uh, and, you know, like I said at the beginning of this talk, you know, bio doing biography takes a lot of work, and I realized, you know, <laughs> this was quite a long t term uh, challenge. And even after nearly four years, I had only covered JFK's early life. It's, it's the book that emerged was called um, JFK Reckless Youth. And when I told my, it, it was turned down by the first publisher who could publisher who'd commissioned it in Boston because they were so worried about the Kennedy family, not because of the portrait that emerges of JFK himself, because he's quite a hero of the book. It's just that it was um, less than idolizing about Kennedy's parents, uh, Rose and Joe Kennedy. And uh, particularly in Boston, Massachusetts in those days, that was the early 1990s, uh, it, it, that was considered les majeste. <laughs> and so uh, although the book became a bestseller and they made a TV drama series of it, um, I, I they made life very, very uncomfortable for me, and um, and I realised it would be very difficult to write a second volume, and uh, so I went back to teach in England. But I I missed the United States, and I missed uh, UMass Boston and my students, and um, uh, I. Then eventually the day came and I I decided I would return and um, and I did two books about uh, President Bill Clinton. Uh, they're not my best books, but um, I they they were quite an eye opener for me because I, I at that point I'd never really been south uh, unless Washington is considered south, <laughs> and uh, I had to do considerable research in Arkansas. And I I loved writing the the books, uh, you know I I into I because I trained as a journalist, I I um, 
you know, I contacted people and I, I really enjoyed doing the interviews just as I had for uh, JFK. You know, I was able to interview uh, the, the nurse who'd actually given birth to Bill Clinton, <laughs> you know, in, in Little Hope and uh, Arkansas. And that. So it, I, I really enjoyed doing the two books. Perhaps I think the, the moral of that was it was too close to the to his life, to the story of his life. And um, in many ways, uh, even though JFK was no longer alive, it, it is, I think most, most biographers would agree, you're much safer dealing with dead people. <laughs> you know, it, um, there can be a lot of uh, pushback from from the family that, and, and keepers of the flame. Let, let me read a quote. This is back in 2007. You can explain this because you've kind of alluded to it. This is from the New York Times <clears throat> Review. He felt, this is you, he felt hazed by the toadies of the Kennedy family, thwarted by the fascistic spirit of the family loyalists at the JFK Library in Boston. And uh, so he gave up after one volume how hard was that and it just it leads to the whole subject of presidential libraries and uh, whether it's the nixon watergate story out in that library or the jfk situation there are a lot of these different libraries won't tell same with lbj and some of the stories that he wouldn't tell G give us the background on that well um FDR really started the tradition of uh, presidential libraries, of presidents giving their papers or the papers being considered to be to be owned by the people of the United States. And uh, so the presidential libraries are funded by the federal government out of our taxes. Uh, but inevitably, uh, they're very expensive to build <laughs> and then even more expensive to maintain over the years. So they depend a lot, uh, not only on the subvention, the annual subvention uh, from the US government, uh, but they depend very much on the family uh, for giving more papers to them and also uh, sponsoring educational schemes, bringing uh, school kids in and so forth. So that that's the worthy side of the uh, president's family being involved in the presidential library. The downside is that <laughs> many of the family members see it really simply as a monument. Uh, a, an, I, would, I would go as far as to say it's a form of idolatry. You know, they, they want this to be a permanent monument to uh, a, a, a husband, a, a, an uncle, an a, you know, um, a good friend, people who worked for the president or whatever. And um, that's tough for the biographer, for the researcher, for the historian, for the, the high school student, if you like, uh, because uh, you're not going to get uh, about any kind of balanced idea of the, not just of the truth, because, uh, you know, we all know, that we, you know, the definitive truth is very hard to arrive at. We just have to do our best to, to, to pursue it. And um, the, the truth is often very uncomfortable. You know, and there, these are, these were, are where the president is still alive. They were human beings, you know, with their um, advanced pluses and minuses. And uh, it, it's often very difficult for the family to accept that if you just present a perfect picture of a, an individual president who has never done anything wrong <laughs> and uh, who is perfect, nobody's going to believe you. <laughs> you know, you may this may go down very well when you hold a party at the presidential library or whatever, but um, none of the people who actually use the library, either for research or 
to visit and to learn about American history are going to believe that. So inevitably there will be conflicts. I'm not the only researcher and biographer who's you know, hit the hit problems in that respect. I mean, Robert Caro, who's probably the greatest of our presidential biographers today, uh, you know, when he began doing LBJ, he ran into uh, difficulties at the LBJ library. And I mean, Richard Nix, I, I, I once gave a talk there and the entire contingent of um, docents walked out. <laughs> because I had written a book called um, American Caesars. It's about the 12 presidents from uh, Franklin Roosevelt through to George W. Bush. Um, it's modeled on the famous Roman texts of the, by Suetonius, the 12 Caesars. So I called it American Caesars and they're just relatively for me, <laughs> short chapters about each of these 12 presidents. Well, the, the, the chapter on Richard Nixon was, you know, pretty, pretty um, honest. <laughs> and the docents, in other words, these were not members of the Nixon family. These were simply people who, often volunteers, who showed people around the Nixon library. And they were incensed at the portrait I gave of, of Nixon. Of Nixon. I mean, in the case, you know, I, I, I'm too old to, you know, still feel resentment. I, I'm over it now. But it was very upsetting to have written a, I thought it was a pretty major contribution to modern American biography, my, my uh, JFK book, because until that time, I think most most members of the public and many, many historians uh, had a view of JFK as this um, playboy who, whose older brother, Joe Jr., had been killed uh, very bravely uh, in an operation in World War II uh, as, as a, a pilot. And... Um, and that the all the uh, family ba uh, money and promotion had been put behind JFK, who apparently, in the general view, was pretty much a not a ne'er do well, but a, a pretty a pretty much of a lightweight. Um, so the family puts its uh, backing behind this uh, young JFK and. And and he 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 becomes president of the United States. Well, <laughs> the truth was, you know, I, and I didn't know this in advance. Uh, I was just curious about him. He was the same age as my father, and my father, had, when he was an editor in London, had come over to the United States and had met JFK. Um, he. I, when I started the book, I, you know, I was very much just curious about him. But the more I researched uh, his early life, the more I realized, you know, if this is a fantasy that he was just a simple playboy, he wasn't interested in politics. This young man lived for politics. He studied politics at Harvard. He couldn't get enough of it. He, so behind this rather charming exterior, um, was a very determined, ambitious young man. And in the course of doing the research, which became pretty exciting, I went through the FBI records in Washington and found that they had tape recorded and then transcribed the tapes of conversations between Jack Kennedy and his girlfriend, who was a journalist in Washington, but who was Danish. And uh, he called her Inga Binga. He was madly in love with her. So madly in love that he, even though he was a, a working in American intelligence at the time of Pearl Harbor in Washington, he was shipped out of Pearl Harbor, out of um, Washington, 
and sent to uh, South Carolina to because uh, his, Inga was uh, denounced by somebody as a possible enemy spy because she, it, as a journalist, she'd interviewed uh, Goebbels and met with Hitler. Anyway, he, the FBI uh, began following him uh, and they don't, were already following her. They began following him once they realized that he was her lover and they put uh, recording equipment in his uh, bedroom at the hotel where she stayed when she came to visit him in uh, South Carolina. And, you know, for a historian, you know, this, this is just so such a wonderful example of how uh, something as if you like, as innocent as a a tape recording of basically of lovemaking can point you to an extraordinarily important historical proof, evidence. Because in a conversation with Inga, they start talking. I mean, he's like 22 years old. He starts talking about his determination to become president of the United States. <laughs> this is not, this is before his brother is killed. It's before, you know. So I, I was finally able to put to rest that whole fantasy of the simple playboy who was not politically ambitious and show that behind that, you know, rather alluring charming screen you know here was a very very committed young man and actually to me uh, coming from a, 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 a modestly liberal background a very moving story because the father basically was a conservative rather right-wing anti-semitic conservative Joseph P. Kennedy and um, considered in England because he'd been a U.S. ambassador to England at the beginning of the war, considered to be uh, a almost an enemy. Uh, and here is his second son. His first son supports Joseph P. Kennedy, Ambassador Kennedy, down to the hilt. You know, gives talks of. Harvard about isolationism and how the United States should stay out of the war and let Britain go down to hell with Europe. And here is this young man, this so-called playboy, <laughs> who actually writes a, 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 a student thesis at Harvard on why it took England so long to face up to the need for mobilization. And then, even though his health is terrible, manages to get, unlike some later presidents, a doctor to sign off a certificate, allowing him to join the US Navy. And not content with his desk job in the safety of uh, the uh, Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington to leave that and join, after he gets out of South Carolina, to join the active Navy and become a PT boat commander. And yes, he gets his, his uh, poor boat uh, cut in half by, you know, they were wooden boats cut in half by a steel hull Japanese destroyer at night. But, you know, he helps save his crew. This is this is an incredible story. It's a very moral story. It's, you know, it, it has ups and downs and he's not perfect or whatever. But this is an example to me of how a biographer can can start on a project 
without knowing, just like any of us really, without knowing a great deal uh, and, and having assimilated, if you like, a lot of um, prejudices and, and, and um, um, superficial views about a, a, a historical person. And through diligent research, I did hundreds and hundreds of interviews, you know, I wanted to test and check out that I, I in a sense, I wasn't making this up, you know, that I could validate this whole thing. And the family hated it. <laughs> but like I say, not because of JFK, uh, but just because they couldn't bear the portrait of the ambassador and even of Rose, who Unfortunately, from the people I interviewed, you know, she had been very much a, a remote and distant, cold mother to JFK. And, and, you know, to some degree, I'm not a psychologist, but it did make me wonder to what extent his kind of, um, his, 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 sexual problem his his uh, his obsession his addiction to sex did emerge you know people would say oh well his father was a philanderer you know he was just copying the father well i don't think most of us just copy our fathers <laughs> i think actually it's probably more common that we do the opposite of our fathers i think it related much more to his mother and the fact that in all those years of his childhood early childhood and later childhood, these youth and so on, when, you know, often he, it was thought that he had leukemia, that he had all kinds of different cancers and so forth before they finally uh, diagnosed Addison's disease, which is, was a fatal disease. Uh, in all those years, every time he was hospitalized, Rose never, ever once visited him. Well, you can probably tell I'm, I hope I'm not a, a moralistic uh, biographer. I, I can see different sides of an argument and, and different versions of a, of a personality. But at the end of the day, the biographer of a single individual, which is very difficult for me now because I'm doing with, dealing with two individuals, Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, but the biographer of a single individual is, you know, does in a sense where, I was going to say the wig, but that's a London thing, but you know, the, where, where's the uniform of, of, an, of a defense attorney, if you like, of, you know, you are arguing a case for this character the, perhaps the importance of this character, certainly the significance of this character in history, if, if you're tackling a major figure of world history. And um, so some people may say, well, Nigel was, <laughs> Nigel was too tough on Rose and Joe Kennedy. They were doing their best. I know Doris Kelsen feels that felt that very strongly and and um, wrote letters to the times denouncing me and Arthur Schlesinger did the same and uh, but, um, but you know basically they were both paid by the Kennedys you know Doris's husband was was on the Kennedy payroll and and Arthur told me he was on the Kennedy payroll they paid for his secretary and so I Yes, I was hurt by the uh, objections by the family, and I, 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 it was tough to realize that they were going to stop anybody they could from talking to me about for my second, my follow-up volumes. Uh, but I think the most hurtful thing was when when my fellow biographers uh, 
in, uh, turn, turned against me and denounced me at the time. That, that you know, <laughs> I'm a sensitive person at heart and um, perhaps I deserved it, but I did go back to England. I, I loved teaching, especially teaching biography in, in England. Um, but I, I miss, miss the United States and I, I miss doing biography here. And, and even though I never did do volume two of the Kennedy book, um, I'm, I've been lucky in that, uh, I, I became, uh, curious about, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and in writing about the chapter on Roosevelt for my book, American Caesars, he was the first of the 12 Caesars. And when I was doing the research, it wasn't very, it wasn't my normal kind of uh, original archival research, but because um, I only had two years to write it. But um, in doing my research, I was amazed that nobody had ever actually written a major study of Franklin Roosevelt as commander in chief in World War Two. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I, I was mildly flabbergasted. <laughs> I, I thought this is impossible. I mean, this man was president and commander in chief of the armed forces of the United States in the most violent war in human history and there is not a proper study of him in that role i i was amazed so that was the origin of um my first book about fdr in world war ii called the mantle of command and you know uh, i'm i began it you must stop me if I'm going on too long about anything, but I, I, I began the book thinking, which is a, an occupational problem with me, thinking that I could condense World War II into one volume for FDR's uh, performance in the role of commander in chief. And again, it wasn't it wasn't very long before I realized that the first year of the war was just about as dramatic as history has ever been in a single year. I mean, if you think about it, you know, so the book begins with FDR meeting Churchill on on a battleship off the in a secret meeting off the coast of Canada and when Churchill begs him to join the war, this is the summer of 1941 and the United States is still a neutral country and Churchill is really struggling and Churchill begs him to join the war, join the uh, defense of democracy in Europe and FDR says, no, 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 <laughs> Atlantic Charter. <laughs> we are not going to fight this war just to preserve your colonial empire, my friend. It, it's an amazing story, FDR at war. And I only wanted it to be one, one book, but that first year, you know, no sooner he left Churchill, who, who had to sign off on the Atlantic Charter than uh, you know, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. <laughs> I mean, how much more dramatic can you get? Uh, and FDR has to become the war president and has to make these major strategic decisions. I mean, imagine just the very question of whether it should be a a one ocean war or a two ocean war. Was the United States just going to fight Japan, which had attacked it, Hitler hadn't. I mean, just the vagaries of history, you know, what if, that it always puzzled me, why, why did Hitler uh, 
why did Hitler um, declare war on the United States four days after Pearl Harbor? What was he thinking? Uh, you know, I was lucky in that uh, my my first wife was German and she died tragically many years ago. But um, I did I did learn uh, pretty good German. I studied for one semester at Munich University, and you know that was a a real a boon or blessing because it enabled me to read Goebbels's diaries, all the diaries which have never been published in English. And because Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, was so close to Hitler and and such a uh, an integral m member of the German high command, it, it, it allowed me to tell FDR's story as a contest between a democratic American president who has to bring Congress with him, uh, who has to manage uh, the chiefs of staff of, of the army, the navy and, and the air force that hadn't really existed before. Uh, how does he manage a contest against an opponent in Adolf Hitler and the Nazis who declared total krieg, total war. And so the book is not just a, a, a the study of a personality. It is the study of of a war and and a time in history and a a struggle between you know great nations. Um, one of the, to me, one of the the revelations of the book, I think there were two, two biggest revelations. One was the way FDR took control of the chiefs of staff. This was not like World War I at, with Wilson and, and Pershing and whatever. This was FDR in control of the chiefs of staff. And this was most uh, dramatically demonstrated. It's, it, it's a landmark moment in, in the uh, trilogy that I wrote where F, the chiefs of staff are determined to launch D-Day in 1942, only a few months after the United States had entered the war. And it would have been for the United States military an absolute bloodbath. And sadly, it was attempted uh, on the coast of France at a little place called Dieppe. And a thousand Canadians died that first day and they never got off the beach. And that is what would have happened to American soldiers if the chiefs of staff had had their way. And going back to what I said earlier about biography and, and the work one has to do, um, it, it, it's very rewarding work, but it is work. I, I uh, used the diary uh, of FDR's uh, Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, uh, who, who was a very considerable man, I think, but he was, uh, he, he was, I think, I wouldn't need to be careful <laughs> what I say. He, it's, he wasn't an ignoramus about military matters, but he, he was a great admirer of General Marshall. And if General Marshall said something was doable, he believed him. And if General Marshall said something was not doable, he believed him. Well, General Marshall said D-Day in 1942 was possible and should be done. 
And it is such a testament to Franklin Roosevelt that he he uh, basically put these men together and read them the riot act and said, I will not put hundreds of thousands of American boys into harm's way in pursuit of a fantasy against Germans who've been fighting East and West for years, who've, who've learned the lessons of modern warfare and who are waiting for us on the coast of France to <laughs> invade. If it was so simple, the British would have done it. <laughs> we will not do it till we are ready. And it is he, Franklin Roosevelt, who said, the, the way forward is not to attack the well-defended coasts of France opposite the, the United Kingdom. The way to go is to choose the point, the very furthest point from Berlin, where there are German soldiers, perhaps six or 20 German soldiers. <laughs> North Africa, French held, Vichy held North Africa, Algeria and Morocco. And it was FDR. I mean, there is so much misinformation about this because after the war, Churchill invented this story that he had been the mastermind of World War II. And in particular, he had been the mastermind of the invasion of North Africa, which is so utterly wrong and in fact deceitful. Uh, and so one of the, to me, the, one of the most uh, fulfilling things as a historian and a biographer was actually to find the evidence in the archives of how FDR not only took control of the American chiefs of staff, but imposed a strategy, a step-by-step -step strategy by which the United States could and would win World War II against the Nazis. When you're... Uh, <clears throat> When, when you're doing a trilogy like this, which is 1,500 pages, 180 chapters, where do you find the time? I, I wrote down, I don't know, probably 10 different diaries that you were <clears throat> quoting in your book, <clears throat> excuse me, um, from FDR to Stimson, as you mentioned, to Daisy Sukli. Explain, because she's in there a lot. Yeah. Why did you decide to use her? Who was she? And why did you decide to use her as often as you did? Well, she was a neighbor. You know, FDR, I'm currently writing about a man who came from a very poor background, the rail splitter, Abraham Lincoln. And um, in some ways, I'm feel closer to him because my father was came from the working well, my grandfather was a steel worker in the north of England and but um, I I did go to a private school in England and um, a boys boarding school and I did mix with a lot of English aristocrats if you like upper class I don't want to say twits, but because <laughs> many of them were very smart. But, um, and so I, I was always amused by the side of FDR, which is the American aristocrat, basically, you know, the landed gentry. Um, and anyone who goes to Hyde Park to the presidential library will see what I mean. Um, Noblesse oblige, you know, this This is a man who grew up uh, an only son of his mother and, uh, you know, did have a 
huge sense of responsibility for the people who worked on on the uh, estate and went to Harvard and, and had all the advantages of Winter Groton and then Harvard. And, and one of his neighbor, neighbors was Daisy Suckley, unmarried, uh, not beautiful, but uh, but a woman who who was uh, very um, very straightforward, very uh, mod modest in her way, not not a not a Lady Astor or anything, <laughs> and uh, he was often very lonely. I think his his relationship with Eleanor had fallen apart. Uh, in, at the end of World War One, when you know they more or less separated. I mean, they lived communal lives, but 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 really as separate couple. And then he got polio, and so the separation was even more pronounced. Um, and they both, I think, Re Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor. I think they both genuinely loved and admired each other. I mean, they'd had six children together and, uh, you know, they were fellow parents and so forth. But I think he was a very lonely individual and Daisy Suckley lived next to him and was very happy to uh, just be company, just to sit with him when he had a, he loved to have a cocktail in the evening. I mean, when you think of the, when you think of the struggle with, with his uh, paralysis, his, you know the struggle as a as a paraplegic. Uh, it it's it's pretty, and often the pain he was in. I mean, you. Yes, it's perfectly understandable that um, he should enjoy company. And the interesting thing to me is that he enjoyed the company of women. And it, and we, you know, I don't mean in the same way as. JFK, for JFK, the company of women meant something completely different. It was like a contest, you know. How how can I wow this this beautiful woman? And hopefully, it will end in sex, even though I'm married. <laughs> uh, I think FDR obviously different when you're paralyzed, but. Uh, I, I think he'd always had that, um, perhaps because he was this only son, his mother was so much younger than her husband. And um, I, I, I think he genuinely, in the very nicest way, loved women. And here was this neighboring woman who was completely uh, dependable. He knew she wasn't going to sneak off and tell stories to the press. And she didn't. You know, uh, the the diary was only uh, found, you know, long after her death, and and was eventually uh, published, nicely edited and published, and it gives you a an insight into this man in his um, most human moments. I mean, when she describes how he is when <laughs> when Churchill visits or whatever, you're, you're seeing not the politician, you're seeing the, the real guy. And um, so I, I think that, you know, historians may disagree. Historians can be pretty snobbish, you know, about <laughs> about their, you know, what qualifies as, as uh, good sources. Uh, but certainly for the biographer, um, those people who keep records, honest records, close up of, of the character you're studying, uh, you know, that is truly a very, very important ingredient in the art of biography. One of the things, and we're not going to get a chance to go into detail on the different battles that's in your trilogy, but one of the things I wanted to ask you about is that, that you write a lot about FDR's health, mm. and, you get, and you also write about uh, Winston Churchill's health. Uh, how much did this impact the decisions that were made, and how sick was FDR? Oh, oh, in in FDR's 
case hugely important. Um, I, I think it, it's one thing that he he was suffering f from from his paralysis um, and had to have uh, you know daily massage to try and keep his legs sort of alive enough to be able to stand on them with these sort of steel stilts and somebody to hold on to. Uh, but um, the the problem was his heart. I mean, it's pretty terrible to think that he dies in his early 60s. I mean, nowadays we think of, <laughs> I'm approaching 80. <laughs> I, I mean, it just seems so unfair. Um, his, his health uh, got worse and worse. Um, partly, obviously, the tension of the war, uh, the stress, the, the, the huge burden of the decisions he was having to make all the time, every single day. Uh, but um, but he, he smoked a lot drank, <laughs> uh, loved his his cocktails, and, you know, in that sense, and he couldn't exercise. What exercise could he do without his legs? You know, I mean, so his heart uh, was always going to be a problem and did become a problem. And then he went on these extraordinary journeys. It was amazing really writing the book when talking to people. And if I would say, well, I'm just writing about when FDR flies across the Atlantic to Casablanca. And they said, what? He flew? <laughs> you know, it's like in the middle of war <laughs> with German airplanes. <laughs> I mean, uh, here, is a, here is a man uh, willing to, he, he goes, he goes by ship to to the middle east to 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 iran to meet with stalin in tehran he has to fly into into tehran i mean people have totally forgotten this uh it was vital to him to keep Russia fighting in the war because the Russians were the ones who were taking the vast casualties that Hitler was willing to to spend to win the war and the Russians were w willing to go on taking those casualties if they felt the United States was going to stay in the war and not switch to Japan and so FDR did go out there but each of those trips was immensely challenging to his health and you know at the same time you're a politician you you have to get re-elected <laughs> in 1944 you only have a four-year term and um should he have run given this well, health condition no of course he shouldn't have he, he was far too ill by then, uh, but um, he felt that he was the only person. He'd established this relationship with Stalin and he felt he could keep uh, the United States in the war to the end. He was determined that the war should end with unconditional surrender of the Germans. He He'd lived through that he'd been assistant secretary of the navy in world war one he'd been in europe he'd been at the versailles when they drew up the treaty he saw he'd seen how the germans after the war pretended they hadn't actually been defeated hadn't actually surrendered it was all a plot by politicians <laughs> and he was determined that this time in this war, the Germans would be forced not to negotiate, but unconditional surrender. And um, even Churchill was shocked by that. Uh, I think he was absolutely right. Um, so he shouldn't have run in 
44, but he felt uh, he had been there at the beginning. He'd undertaken a two ocean war. He'd, he'd found a way of controlling the, the United States chiefs of staff. Uh, he, he, he managed these incredible American egos. Think of MacArthur. And he'd, with his charm and intelligence and brilliance, he'd, he'd managed to make sure that these potential uh, rivals, uh, in a sense, stayed in place doing the most important thing, which was winning the war. And so he decided he should run. I, I think he was very reluctant and um, it, it's quite something to think about this today <laughs> with a, 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 a very elderly president, sitting president, and an almost equally elderly former president. But um, for good or ill, um, he took the decision uh, and I, 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 I think you have to be a historian rather than a biographer to judge whether it was right or wrong. Whether because uh, at Tehran he was well enough uh, to convince Stalin that the United States would make sure that D-Day happened. You know, Churchill was dead against D-Day. Churchill had decided that the British w were uh, beginning to not just go bankrupt, but they, they no longer had the, the manpower to run an empire. And for Churchill, everything was to do with empire, the British empire. And so Churchill was determined that the war should stay in the Mediterranean. He did not want British soldiers basically to uh, across the channel. And um, I, I don't know if Stalin would have come to some negotiation with with um, Hitler if FDR hadn't convinced him at Tehran that the United States would carry out the D-Day invasion. And, and it did. Uh, FDR personally appointed uh, Eisenhower instead of General Marshall to command the D-Day invasion. Really one of the great appointments in military history. And when he goes to Yalta at the beginning of the following year, uh, he's thinking not so much about uh, the end of the war, he he's he he has a, a secret in his pocket which he doesn't divulge to Stalin, which is the atomic bomb. But um, he's really thinking about the future. He is determined to set up um, what he called the United Nations. He he called the United Nations the group of allies fighting uh, Hitler and the Japanese in at the end of 1941 after Pearl Harbor. But he, he thought that would be a great title for an organize, a permanent organization, a global organization, the United Nations. So on the plus side, um, I think it, that was his great achievement in going all the way to the Crimea uh, in terrible health. Um, let, me, a, let me ask you about that trip because you detail yeah. it in the book. But one of the things that's hard to, when you know how sick he is, yeah. and then he gets there, and then once he lands, he's got a five and a half hour road trip in a car to get to Yalta and you get to the hotel where he's staying. Why would his people around him not just come down hard and say, you can't do this? I, I think he, I think he felt that he, um, I think he felt that Stalin would only uh, respect him as the president of 
the world's leading nation of the democracies, if if he was considered too frail to even get from the airport <laughs> to this uh, palace, which uh, ironically <laughs> the communist <laughs> had prepared for months and months, they'd been, you know, bringing in French. Wait, waiters and wines and champagnes and cleaning the rooms and putting heating in them. Uh, he wanted to show Stalin that uh, he he still had it in him to to sit at the table and negotiate a United Nations. Um, uh, perhaps foolhardy, he could have died just like you say on that road trip. I mean, through through this sort of snowy landscape. Uh, I, I I don't know. Words fail me. What, what a man! A lot of uh, people, are, as you know, in the government and around him, did not like the idea of a United Nations. How do you think that's worked out over time? Well, I think. One should remember that he never thought that the kind of um, world of allies, if you like, and United Nations would, I think I remember he didn't think it would last more than about 70 years. And, you know, he wasn't far off. Um, you know, that that was the extent to which he thought these organizations could could last. Uh, and I think the people who've been most critical of him at Yalta are, are those who feel that he let down uh, the European countries that Stalin occupied at the end of the war, um, including especially Poland. And and they're not wrong. I mean, I think in his effort to uh, persuade Stalin to stay on board and create this organization, um, he, he gave away a lot. And if you're somebody, I have a number of friends who are of Polish extraction, uh, it, you know, for them it is unforgivable. Uh, but uh, politicians sometimes have to make those choices. In terms of the United Nations itself, you know, the, again, only a historian can judge the extent. You know, none of these things are perfect. It's done wonderful things. Um, I have a great friend from college days who works in epidemiology and um, you know, in terms of world health in Africa and other places, it's done. The the it it's been a, a wonderful organization. Whether it's whether we as humanity can uh, are up are as good as the um, the ideal. I don't know. We're we're spinning in strange directions, um, and in a sense, this goes beyond my competence <laughs> as a biographer. It becomes a question of personal opinion. I'm going to have to let you go because we're running long on time. But I, before we do, a couple of questions just about how you work. What kind of how long how long of a day do you have when you're writing? Six hours. What what hours of the day? Um, I I wake at five thirty. I make coffee for my wife at six, <laughs> and <laughs> feed the dog. <laughs> yeah, don't know if you've heard his barking, <laughs> and and then I start work. And then sometime after midday, uh, perhaps one o'clock, I I have to take a nap. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> I am mentally exhausted, but I, I try and put everything into it. And um, 
And then I, I, do, how many days a week do you write? I'm not allowed to work on Sundays. And not for religious reasons. <laughs> well, my wife is a Catholic, but, uh, but um, just uh, to keep the, the ticker going, ticking. <laughs> now, the, where I see you sitting now, it looks like an office of some kind. Do you do all your work there? I do all my work here. And when I turn the lights out and go downstairs, I live in Somerville, in, in just on the edge of Boston. Um, I never come back to the study. Uh, I, I I try and leave it, and you know allow the what's left of the brain to, <laughs> to recuperate. Uh, in you know I I may do reading, although that's getting more difficult with my eyesight. But I I may do reading, but even that is done elsewhere. And by the way, does the JFK Library, which you're not that far from, up there uh, at uh, in Boston, do they have your book for sale? I don't think they. It was for sale shortly after it when it came out. This was years ago in I think in I don't know 1992. But Eunice Kennedy, who worshipped her dad. <laughs> She came into the library one day and she saw this stack of, there was a sort of kind of box, frame box uh, display of, of JFK Reckless Youth. And the story is she just swept it with her arm across the floor. And I don't think any of my books has ever been sold again, even though it's a federal even though my taxes are paying for it, but we move on. I it, it it you know what? That's one of the saddest things for a biographer who has a a sort of moral a moral heart and and belief in humanity is the extent to which some people are willing to kind of serve the master to the point of uh, total loyalty and you know when they you know some of my mail was actually broken open not just broken open at the Ken at the kennedy library but the contents of my letter to my publisher were distributed by the director of the library to the Kennedy family to turn them against me. I mean, the, I was going to say, I can't forgive it, but I do. It's, you know, human nature is in some ways sometimes quite distressing. Last question. Can you, can the people listening, if they want to read any of your books, including the trilogy on uh, the war, World War II and FDR, are they still for sale? Oh, yes. And I, I'm uh, delighted to still have readers, and I hope that uh, when uh, Lincoln versus Davis comes out, uh, um, those who've enjoyed the previous books will find the the story of the Civil War as enthralling as the Second World War. Nigel Hamilton, thank you for your time and for your books. Thank you. I've enjoyed the interview. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments? We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.